Hi, Stacy. Hello, I've been thinking about you. <laughs> oh, that's nice. I hope it was good thoughts. <laughs> yes, of course. Happy anniversary, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Good. I'm doing good. Oh, How's... I should put... I'm sorry. I thought my camera was on. Sorry. <laughs> How are things in New York? New York. Um, New York. Coming back to life a little bit. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm in a smaller... You know, I'm outside the city, but Where in like a, a Nyack, New York. Oh, yeah. Okay. I was born in Ridgewood and my parents are from the Bronx. And I spent my childhood around the city. Oh, so you. I lived in Governor's Island for a year in 76. And yeah. so I am familiar. Look, like humans. They, they said. Jerry, how are you uh, holding up in the heat, man? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I was going to report in. The heat peaked on Monday. And uh, at, at 6 p.m. Monday, it actually peaked from the previous five days where it had been like, Raw. and it peaked at 111 here. Wow. Uh, 115 recorded at the airport, which I guess is a lot hotter. Um, 111 is plenty hot. I went outside at 6 just to, like because I could see on my little device when it was going to peak. And I'm like, I wonder what that's like. And it's pretty much like being in an air fryer. <laughs> um, oh, Jerry, how hot is Did you have air conditioning? And we... Three, four years ago, we installed AC in our flat, like regular, you know, full, full on AC and our flat is really tiny. So, uh, you know, it wasn't a big strain on the, on the AC and we were fine. And, and uh, the power utility seems to be much more competent than Texas. Uh, That's something. But I do, have, I do have our Nest thermostat registered with PGE, uh, not PG and E, but here it's just PGE. And uh, they do like do a little bit of management of, uh, of the temperies, but they didn't do anything mean to us on uh, during the heat wave, so that was nice. Uh, but it was. Note. Go ahead. Interesting note about PG and E. I, um, you know, I hate that company. So I, when I was writing checks, I'd make them out to pigs, goats, and emus, and um, <laughs> they would cash them every single time. <laughs> Funny how people take money, even even. I thought the check had to be made out to the proper entity, you know, but they would they would. And I, I started off with pigs, goats, and elephants, and I thought, I don't want to insult the elephants, so for emus instead. So, <laughs> Pigs are smart, too. They I are. They are. But, um, but the, the problem with pigs and octopi and squid is that they're incredibly intelligent and tasty, too. And, like, it's bad. Yeah, yeah. I, I, don't, eat, um, I don't eat squid or octopi, but now and then I'll have some bacon. Because bacon is actually, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not pork, it's bacon. Is it its own food group? <laughs> so, so small side story, the, our habit of having bacon for breakfast and thinking of bacon as yummy food, we owe in part to Eddie Bernays, the father of public relations. Uh, really? and, and if you think about it, like they had too much pork belly, mm. like the pork industry, uh, eating high on the hog means eating pork loin, which is the high part of the pig. That's the better part of the pig. And there was a whole bunch of spare pork belly they didn't know what to do with. So the pork industry goes to Eddie and says, what do we do? And he's like, I know, we'll sell this Try as it. magic magic food for breakfast. So, you know, bacon and eggs winds up being like the hearty breakfast. He also sold us orange juice for breakfast because the, the orange industry was like, dude, we got a lot of oranges. How do we get rid of the oranges? He also sold us women smoking in public. There's the famous Torches of Freedom March um, and where he, he got a bunch of uh, attractive debutantes uh, on Easter parade day in New York City, walking down Fifth Avenue to pull out cigarettes and light up at, on cue basically at the same time. And he had told some press that he knew his friends, I hear something's crazy is gonna happen during the Easter parade, you should show up. So Eddie Bernays is like behind the scenes for, he also okay. popularized the Diaghilev ballets, the color green uh, ivory soap. He helped invent uh, ivory soap carving competitions during the great depression. So people mm. bought a whole bunch of ivory soap to carve and, and do contests. That was all That was all to sell more soap. I assume Bernays sauce used to be called something else until he renamed it. <laughs> I, I, I don't think he gets any credit for sauce Bernays. Yeah, but it could be. He, he, and he was also uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew. And maybe the most interesting thing of all the things he did was uh, he was part of the Office of Public Information in Woodrow Wilson's administration at the end of World War I. And Wilson goes to 1919 Paris peace talks 
and is hailed as a conquering hero because their PR is so damn good because America was really late to the, to the war, did almost nothing, and yet gets all this, all this credit. Um, so after the peace talks, he goes to visit his uncle Sigmund in Vienna, and he's like, oh, these books are pretty good. None of, none of Freud's works are, are translated into English or known in America yet. And so uh, Eddie has them translated, has them like publicly available, and then becomes the authority in his uncle's work. And, become, and a lot of this is chronicled in The Century of the Self, which is the great four-part series by Adam Curtis about the uses of psychology in business and politics. Uh, so the whole first hour is a biography of Eddie Bernays. Uh, and so Freud's theories become super popular in the US and lots of other places, uh, in part because Eddie Bernays publicizes his uncle. Wow. By the way, High on the Hog, yes. Netflix, really worth watching. Totally worth watching. Only worth watching. Jerry, uh, Jerry when, when did he invent bacon? Well, he didn't actually <laughs> invent bacon. Bacon was actually invented by pigs. Um, but but he popularized it. Oh, I, I don't know exactly. You'd have to look up a, a bio of, of when the pig the pig people, you know, when the pig people hired him. Yeah. Notably for him, he he was he was approached by uh, Goebbels uh, to do PR for the Nazis to turn them down. That's uh, only like casualty because one of his books, Crystallizing Public Information, was on Goebbels' bookshelf and one of his favorites. Yep. So yeah, so I don't. He had his limits. Yeah, exactly. Um, Stacy, thank you for for um, adding that in the chat here. Uh, and I, let's let's uh, duplicate that onto the chat in MetaMost where we're trying to corral our. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't get it. Now I can try to do it. Now that you put the link there. And Ken just put the link. Thank you so much. That's much appreciated. Um, and uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. close this, open the spreadsheet again and see if anybody has added themselves. So John, excellent. Alfred E. Newman refuses to show up for these calls, but he is on the list there. Uh, does anybody get an Alfred E. Newman reference anymore? I do. What? Do you worry? Exactly. I, I think I think that means that we skew older here is all, but yeah. Um, it's, maybe it's like an age test of some sort. I used to be able to say, uh, you know, get smart quips to, to, to do stuff. It's like get smart has kind of aged off. Uh, Guild, we have a spreadsheet that we created. Uh, here we go. This is a spreadsheet that we created to sequence up people who would like to check in to change the protocols for how we're doing this. And the, the notion is that we're going to split the call in half with the first half, the first 45 minutes being plenary and the second half being uh, breakouts. Last week, we kind of like, we were sort of about this size at the half and we decided to just stay in, stay in plenary. Uh, but, but we did pick one of the topics that was in the air and focus on that rather than staying in check-in mode. And that was, that was pretty interesting. Um, so hi, everybody. Uh, I'll, I'll just report in the, the heat. It, it like 111 degrees Fahrenheit is pretty hot. Um, we were fortunate to have air conditioning, so uh, not struggling that way. And the city opened like the convention center and a bunch of other places as emergency cooling down spots. Uh, but I th there was a chart, I think, in the Wall Street Journal about how much of an outlier the last three days were in the Pacific Northwest. And, and it basically, you see the band of average temperatures every year, you know, months of the year. And then you see that these three days, they're lying way outside the band, like way above the band. And you just look at that and go, man, if this starts happening more often everywhere, uh, the yeah. climate future is going to be really unpleasant. Uh, Gil, Gil has as his background, uh, the temperature rise graph, what's this, it called? This is, this is uh, Stripes. Yeah. Uh, find it at sharestripesithink.org. This is, the, the bands are annual average temperatures. Uh, in this case, it's 1850 to 2020 California. You can get global, you can get your country, you can get in many cases your city. Um, the thing you're describing is obviously more granular going down to daily and monthly, uh, where you can see that there's, you know, in a lot of cases, there's, there's a, a, you know, annual variation. You look at the California water graphs, it's, it's quite stunning that drought is normal in California. It's a cyclical process. And what we're in now is not that. This is something other than that. Uh, so it's a great way to visualize the patterns and trends. And this is the, this is the latest buzzy visualization on the app. It is indeed. Um, thank you. So let's uh, consult said spreadsheet for a second and um, go John Ken Bentley.
Good morning. Uh, Good morning. And by the way, I may have missed her when she, if she came in earlier, but I see Grace is here and in which case, welcome. Uh, great to see you. Um, so I was doing some work on, I nicknamed it the, the bubble breaker browser. And I'm playing with this idea. It's, it's, it's borrowed from the old concept of equal time. You know, in, in, in the 80s, up, up through the 80s, a network, the way they would balance, they would say, well, we gave some free TV interview time to this candidate, so we got to give equal time to the other candidate. And, you know, it was imperfect, of course, uh, but, you know, you, you missed it when it was gone, and it, it, it went away in the 80s <laughs> because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, mostly Reagan, Reaganites, hated it and told the FCC, just stop doing that. Well, then, of course, about the same time as it was banned, the first email messages were being sent across the ARPANET. And of course, now we're in this whole, whole different world where, oh, everybody's a creator. Anybody can send a message. How could you say equal time? It's not time. It's, it's bandwidth. It's, you know, blah, 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 blah. Okay, well, well, wait a minute, but we're not all equal. And in fact, um, not only are there influencers, but there are bots and there are, uh, then there's targeting. And um, this group has, it's among many groups that is sensitive to uh, both the challenges presented by this and the challenge presented, presented by incomplete attempts to understand it, such as uh, surveillance capitalism. I mean, you know, it's, it's great that that book exists. It's it got a lot of people thinking. And, but, you know, not, now what? I mean, you know, we're in, we're in a situation now where authoritarianism might be on the verge of trumping capitalism, no pun intended, because China, India, all these other places just say, well, look, look, look no, none of that stuff, <laughs> none of that stuff matters to us. What we care about is, can we identify anybody who's saying anything subversive? So we want to know everything about everybody and you don't have anything to say about it and you just better give us all that data because we have a replacement for you and if you don't, you know, you're, you're out of here. And um, so we're, we're, in, we're in a future in which the, the scary, dangerous capitalist version of surveillance is being replaced by the scarier, more dangerous government sponsored versions of surveillance manipulation control, yikes. So I don't know that an equal time browser is, is like a little candle in the wind, but I'm trying to develop a spec for a device that would basically be initially used in schools on a voluntary basis. And the idea is, you know, you pull up one website that you're interested in or that's been sent to you algorithmically. And what the browser does is it says, well, we, we found this other point of view that uses some of the data that's in the website that just is talking to you. So would you like to look at these two different points of view and think about how are they different? What's going on here? How, how, is, how is one side interpreting the data versus the other side? And the idea is that you teach people that skill of saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, there's another view, there's another view. And that this is one of the, uh, well, it's either a fig leaf <laughs> that covers up what's going on, or it actually begins to build a citizenship that can resist um, surveillance, whether capitalist or authoritarian. So that's that's what I'm working on. And uh, comments welcome. Thank you. And I think I think a lot of people have ideas about this. And so uh, I do a search on uh, uh, election fraud that says that there was no, in fact, no election fraud in 2020. But the both sides this argument is like, of course, there was election fraud. The election was stolen, and the equal time browser then shows me like an equal number of articles that say the election was stolen. Actually, I thought the I thought the side by side metaphor was important. So I, I think it shows you two because if it shows you it shows you a huge number, you immediately turn it off. I mean that's that's part of how saturation censorship works. 
so it, it, the, the, the trick would be to find the one that's similar to what you're looking at, but, but different enough that it, it pops at you with, and gives you, and, you know, it triggers the curiosity about, well, wait a minute, some things are clearly the same between these two, and some things are clearly different. And what are those things? And let me look at that. Let me find that. Right. And it either does it by, if you're using a phone, you got to have another screen. But if you're using a browser uh, on, a, on a computer, conceivably, it could be actually the left and the right screen. Uh, anyone with thoughts, contributions? Yeah, uh, sure. Please go ahead, Gil. Sorry, I, 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 I couldn't raise my hand. I apologize. Um, the um, oh god, there there are some uh, some new sites that have emerged that are trying to do something like this, John. I don't remember the names of them. Maybe you've seen some of them. But they're trying to provide some sort of balancing. Uh, Colbert did a great bit a couple of years ago where he brought out uh, Bill Nye for a debate with a client, climate denier, like equal time two people, uh, and then flooded the stage with you know ninety eight other scientists. Uh, to kind of display the, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> what the array of opinion is, that it's not just one-to-one -one e you know, equal, uh, equal positions, but uh, a real lopsided perspective on this. Um, um, and I had something else, but, oh yeah. Uh, and just to something you said earlier about authoritarianism, Trump and capitalism, uh, for me, that sort of sidesteps the question of who owns governments. Yeah. And these are not separate and independent entities. And that's, you know, part of the path to fascism, which is, I think one of our major concerns right now. Um, I've, been running yes. around, I've been running running around as one of the people saying climate is the most important issue on the planet. And I am coming to think that we don't get to deal with the climate issue if we don't deal with the rising fascism issue. I am, and I, I, I agree with that. I mean, that, that's part of the reason I'm interested in leaning on trust and trying to rebuild trust is that we don't get to talk, Absolutely. period until Absolutely. we solve some of those things. Doug? Yeah, what if the chance is that the only way to deal with climate change, in particular cutting CO2, is going to be some kind of overreaching authoritarian structure? I don't like to think that, but it might be that it's the only possible way of getting the leverage. So the closest thing we have to that at scale in the world today is Xi Jinping in China, who's kind of making himself president for life. Um, and I was just reading comments yesterday that were like, China is probably leading the green revolution and really, really like way out there, but has just as many coal fired plants as it, uh, as it used to, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know, but it Those feels like comments. Oh, that's right. Thank you, Ken. I'm like, I read too many things yesterday. So I got confused about what, where, um, and that you're totally right. Uh, so, so how does, how does that, like, if anybody, if anybody could do that today, right, in some kind of organized fashion, it would be China. And they're doing that, and Doug, that's exactly one of the dilemmas that we face now. You know, if that's the trade-off, what do we do? Will, will you accept authoritarianism as the price for a stable climate? Right, and, and you know, Mao Zedong famously did the four pest campaign. One of those pests was sparrows. They killed off all the sparrows in China and then had a famine for several years because the sparrows were eating pests that were, you know, that were eating their crops. Uh, so authoritarianism, is, uh, well-informed authoritarianism might be super interesting. It's also caused like enormous grief. Um, so I'm like, I'm like, how do you make the right decisions? Uh, Grace, then Mark. Yeah, so wow, this is a really rich conversation. It's really in my wheelhouse. So the first thing is that you're talking about like the rise of, of uh, whatever you're calling it, fascism, totalitarianism, authoritarianism. And from anyone who's not in the United States, it's really obvious you guys are there. There's no question that that is a totalitarian state to anybody who's ever lived in one or lived in one that used to be one. And it's very interesting that the Americans, many Americans I find extremely confused because they think they're living in a free country. And they're like, what's all this censorship going on? And why is YouTube banning people? And why are people being deplatformed? And you can see the people, or you're like, you can see Mark and the people who aren't in the United States. It's obvious to everyone in the world, the situation you guys are in. You've got, you know, you have, you know, it's, just, it's really upsetting for as somebody who was born there to just watch this. And, and so the first thing is to not be confused about where we are. And we don't have even local censorship in that case. We have global censorship because the United States government is dictating what YouTube and what Twitter and what Facebook 
can publish and what Google and the Google results and Google and all these organizations have said, yep, we're going to publish. This is specifically around COVID. They had no problem with flat earth, but they do have a problem with scientists saying certain things about the vaccines, including the, you know, like people who are very authoritative on these matters. So this is a really big problem. So that when John is talking about, you know, how do we show that the experts are more expert than someone else. Like the Brexit is a perfect example. Like a, in, in a, a friend of mine was telling me in Britain, they were trying to show um, fair coverage, exactly what you were talking about, like both sides. And they'd have to bring an economist and a person off the street because they couldn't find one economist in all of Britain who was pro-Brexit. And so it's like, okay, you know, that's not equality. Like you said, that's stupidity. And saying, you know, well, we've got as many people on the street who are regular citizens who disagree with this and no economists. So, but, but the thing is that right now you have scientists losing their jobs for saying things that are against what the CDC has or against various things. You have a highly politicized um, scientific organization. Um, everything is run by money in one way or another. I mean, anybody who hasn't you know, I can provide references on this, but and you might disagree with the references and you might disagree with me, which is great. We're having a conversation. You disagree with me. It's great. But the thing is that now we're in a, a situation where the top universities are corrupted by money. And so now we don't even know who the experts are. And it's just a dire, dire situation when you're trying to talk about how do we display, right, expertise when all of our institutions, and I think almost everybody here, like if I said, okay, you know, raise the number of figure, fake fingers of institutions that you trust right now, you know, we'd all be going like this, right? Because maybe one or two, you know, like it's like, yeah, it's we, and so that's one, one part. The second part is about totalitarianism uh, and would that help us deal with climate change? And I don't see evidence of that, not with China, not with anybody. I do not see evidence and uh, first of all with China, but second of all, with how almost every country in the world is handling the pandemic, maybe with the exception of China and Japan and Korea, you know, like there's three or four that are like, okay. But the rest of them, it's like, yeah, if these guys could run anything like preventing mass death from a biological threat, then I'd be like, okay, maybe we should put them in charge of climate change too. But right now, it's just, it, it's there, there isn't a word for how appalling and egregious and horrifying the government handling and that's everywhere of the pandemic is there's just no words for how incompetent that is and so saying oh yeah well but if we had a you know some good like we're that's that dream is gone these institutions have are evolving out and we really need to look at, at, at biomimicry. We really need to look at biological systems. We really need to look at decentralized systems. And unfortunately, we don't have time and it will take time, but I don't think there's an alternative. And we really need to start looking at protocols. And when I think about distributed systems, distributed human systems, I think about three areas um, that need to be there for that to work. And one is communications methodologies. And you know, money is the one I talk about the most often. That's clearly, you know, if you have a measurement and a, but for, for climate change, it would be agreements and interoperability protocols around um, ecological standards. So you know, things that would be able to say, okay, this is this is uh, soil that's getting healthier. This is air that's getting healthier. This is water that's getting healthier. And and maybe not everybody uses the same standard, but the protocols are interoperable. So interoperability protocols and communications protocols, that that's what you need in order for it to be a global organization, even though it's not coming from above. It's just like we can talk to each other and understand where each other stand. The second one is sort of a, um, it is sort of, so that's, so there is the communication protocol. So one is sort of the standard, you know, this thing. And the second one is kind of the law, which is the set of values or the set of rules. Like, okay, it, you know, your country, your region, your city has to be going down instead of up in terms of their carbon footprint, something like that. Like some protocols that would say, this is what we're measuring. And again, protocols are very, they're very complex. We have them all the time. Like, 
okay, do you raise your hand? That's a protocol, right? Do you drive on this side of the street or that side of the street? We have all these protocols about how to behave. And then that usually goes with a mythology or you know, some sort of shared story, right? The, the, the American dream, a shared story. And so I think those three things are the elements, like the communication methods, the communication protocols, the laws, and the stories, and that's what creates a distributed system. So we're very long off from there, but um, that's what I think our best hope is. Anyway, so those are a bunch of different topics that touch on the different things that John brought up. And almost everything you mentioned is extremely ogm -y and is like in the heart of where I think we're aiming. Um, all our efforts aren't political or in that nature, but, but very much about the protocols and communication platforms, very much about the laws, regs, and, 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 and really a lot about the stories, means, tropes uh, that govern everybody's behavior. So Grace, thank you for, for putting that in the conversation. You, you like grew our radar uh, by doing that. Uh, Mark, Ken, then Pete. Uh, Pete, yes. are you deciding to step off the queue? Okay, so uh, sorry, Mark, then Ken. Yes, I, I, thank you, Grace. You covered so much ground here. Um, just want to add something to, to what Doug and, and, and Grace have been saying. You know, the origin of the word tyrant is Roman. Right? Some tires? Tyrant. I know. I'm just joking. We have tires. They didn't have tires. It broke. Oh, was not right. Discovered. There yes. were tyrants before there were tires. Exactly. Sorry, I didn't interrupt. What, what exactly. Was well, the thing was uh, so the uh, Senate would elect a tyrant, right, with one specific duty. So that person would have full power to execute one thing. And if that person would keep power, which happened, usually it would be murdered. And that is pretty much seen in many other different um, civilizations, including the Celts. Um, and, and what I found fascinating in the rhetoric of having one centralized government that would decide for everybody else, that's the autocratic right, it has always failed. And no matter where you look at it, it has failed. And that's probably why in some degrees, the United States is also on the way down rather than on the way up. And decentralization as a mean of government, governance is probably what is required today to fix the problem because the problems are not, they look global, but they're local. And there's this little barrier in between a decentralized future and the status quo, which is these things, I mean, one of many barriers are these things called nations that feel very strongly about their borders that uh, run rampant on their populations and have lots of external effects, so. Yes, but so. you know, even, even, even at the size of a small country like France, you have different realities, whether so you live in Brittany or you live in the South, or you live in the North or in the East or the center, very different realities. Um, Ken. So um, this is a continuation of, of the conversation that Gil and I were in yesterday, or that I can't remember who started it about uh, Russia as a superpower, it might have been Klaus or someone. Um, and, you know, I watched with uh, horror as one man undid 50 years worth of environmental legislation and, and progress, you know, and it's like, I don't think we have come to grips with the fact that people who run arms industries and fossil fuel industries have this enormous power and they really don't give a flying fuck about anything except for their power and their, and their money. And what is it going to take for us to come face to face with that and digest that and stand up in a way that's actually effective? Um, and that was what I wanted to put out for a breakout room. And I need to leave in about um, 20 minutes. I, I can't stay for the whole call today. But, um, you know, I, I think this is something that, that people have avoided this, you know, we have to confront the ugliness of um, people who are mercenary and don't have any real um, uh, care for the harm they're, they're creating. They don't seem to have any conception that they're part of an historical uh, tradition and that, that we're, we have posterity, there's people came behind them. There doesn't seem to be anything in their thinking that connects them to a line of ancestry and descendants. So what will it take for us to actually 
get real on that and come up with a plan that works because I think we're running out of time. We're running out of options. Um, and that seems to be the elephant in the room that, and it's interesting that that elephant is the power as the symbol for the GOP. So you know, I don't hear people talking about that. It's like, well, you know, we're making progress here, making progress there. We're going to do this. And I just don't see it happening. I'm really, really concerned. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Pete. Uh I want to thank Grace for uh, her distributed uh, humans thing. I think that's the right answer. Um, and Ken, I, I also agree with you. Um, uh, I want to note that the problem there isn't particular people. It's social structures that allow one um, uh, psychopathic human to have that much power. So. Um, I, it, it's taken me a while to kind of realize that because I was like, oh, if only um, if only Rupert Murdoch hadn't existed or if only, you know, whoever it is didn't exist. But the, the problem isn't a person. There's always going to be somebody who volunteers to step into being the, the capital asshole. Um, it's uh, the, the problem is really that we've set up social structures that centralize power and centralize money in a way that means that somebody's going to be at the top and maybe they'll be a good guy and probably they won't. Um, I would love nominations from anybody on the call to um, your favorite distributed adventures, like who is actually trying to solve, who is getting somewhere and solving for this in a distributed way. And how does that work? How, how do you have distributed governance models uh, on topics like slavery or sex trafficking or whatever? Like, what, 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 what? How do we, how do we get somewhere globally that's more or less fair with a lot of distributed autonomy you mean, and local you sovereignty? Mean, you mean in a white mid world? No, I mean for everybody. Uh, but, but. Are there, are there some basic human, like for instance, in, in the US, like should slavery be a thing that's just up to states? Should every state be able to decide whether the people can hold slaves? And there was at one point a national decision made that nope, nope, slaves, slavery, slavery in its traditional form anyway, like forget wage slavery, other, other modern, modern forms of bondage, but, but that thing got made illegal nationwide by the federal government. What's the equivalent worldwide? And is that an issue that should be illegalized worldwide? So I'd like to talk about who's doing great work on that. But, um, you know, like me is, is really the answer, but I can talk about some like of the other that. projects as well. Um, and, you know, the problem is that it doesn't pay to be a revolutionary. Um, I mean, we're seeing some interest, you know, Hollow Chain, I would say, is doing the most interesting infrastructure in that area in terms of creating a decentralized um, computing system. And they're way behind on delivery and whether it's going to work and et cetera, et cetera. Those are all very big questions because they're trying to replace everything about the internet, including the boxes including you know the hardware the software the internet protocol the addressing protocol because they recognize that in order to become independent you really have to become independent you can't say we're going to still use some of that parts because you get sucked into it again and i think that that is part of that and you can look at um you know so that's really one of the projects and you can look at the other one that i think is doing good work is regen network which is working on the they're on the cosmos protocol and they're, they're working on protocols for regeneration. When it comes to governance, I'm not impressed by the other stuff because you know I'm, I have a very large ego, but the, the way that I'm envisioning it is as a, um, I don't know what I'm say, like a layered tier of reputational protocols, okay? So how does that look? Like I as an individual have a, proto have a reputation and that reputation is granted to me by the different organizations that I belong to. So here I have a certain reputation and you know that might be good or bad or whatever, but I might have an OGM reputation that you guys have about me. Now that might be digitized in a way I could carry it around. And then I've got maybe a reputation that I'm a good driver or a bad driver or you know a reputation as a Frisbee player or whatever that is. And so I have these tiered reputations. In, that are coming from organizations. Now, each one of those organizations has a reputation as well. And that might be my town. Let's say my town has a reputation for, um, you know, allowing slavery, for
for example, or for throwing out the old people or for, um, you know, sharing all the food equally or whatever it is. My, my rep so there's my reputation and then it's wrapped inside of my town's reputation. And that would could include a carbon footprint or however we, some of these ecological protocols. And then that might go out to the region. Now, I see this as eventually either supplementing or completely replacing money. So it's like, okay, well, if you come from this region, so you could think about this in the EU, right? Inside the EU, let's say I've got a healthcare card from Slovenia, that might be good everywhere in the EU because the EU countries said, okay, we're gonna, you know, if you've got free healthcare in Slovenia, that means you get free healthcare in the next country over. That's what we've done for, for example, for our um, cell phones, right? If you've got a cell phone from one country, it works in the other country. And that's part of your package. And we've got an agreement about that. So your reputation could work the same way, okay? And so if I go to somewhere and I show my health card, I get services. And then if I do that too much, they're like, this person never lives in their home and doesn't pay any taxes or whatever it is, right? So you could have all these multi-tiered things. And in the same way, you might say, okay, well, we live next to this community that allows for slave trade. And if we don't provide them any of our services, because they're known for that. And maybe if it gets to some point, all of us around, you know, all the towns around them sit down and say, look, we got to do something about this guys. What are we going to do? It might be peaceful. It might be whatever, but like, what are we going to do about the one rogue town or that town doesn't share their food and whatever it is. So that's how I see a federated system working as this kind of layered reputa reputational lever. And you might be like, well, where's the governance? And the governance is completely distributed in that case, which means that based on who you are, we decide how we're gonna handle you. And if, the, if you have a good gossip protocol or something, it's like you can go and you can say, hey, I'm from this town and I understand that you guys have developed some really great uh, intellectual property for um, printing, you know, 3D printing of, of chipsets or recycling of lithium so that we can create new whatevers. And they might, and they'll like, like, okay, well, let's look at your town's reputation and see what you might be doing with this lithium that you recycle off of the, right? Or the silicon that you recycle. And, and are we going to share our IP with you? Because IP, who, who the heck pays for that anymore? It's just free. It's IP, you know, who, but if you, you know, it's like, eh, I don't know about it. You guys have been, you know, whatever your carbon footprint isn't really good or whatever. Are you trying to improve it? Is that why you want this? You know, and then you decide, are you going to share or not with them? so that it could be used as a coordination mechanism, it can be used as a trade mechanism and, and for different kinds of privileges. And that's where governance is gonna come in. And I don't think, I mean, it's not ideal, but that's how biosystems work, right? That's how biological systems work. It's like, okay, you know, one part of the body, it's like, oh, I'm running. Now my entire body has to figure out, okay, we need to, you know, the heart needs to pump up more and whatever. So it, it's a little bit like biomimicry. Yeah, I mean, although, Although an organism, let's say a human body, has a bunch of things that it just must maintain, must maintain or it dies, where communities sitting next to each other, meh, maybe, maybe not so much. Like they could have very different sorts of organizations and not, not kill off uh, the whole land, at least not for a long time. So, I mean, if your pH gets out of whack or your salt balance gets out of whack or whatever, you're, you're like your organism, your whole body just dies. And that degree of coupling uh, and interdependence, I think, is hard to find in, among cities, for example. Well, I, I think that part I, of the I, problem, I, yeah. yeah, I think part of the problem is how callous we are, right? Like if your body, as, as many cells of your body were dying as people are dying in cities, your body would respond. So actually, that's not true. We're just, there's something, it's like, it's like our cities are living with cancer in them and just being like, oh, so what, there's cancer, we'll just lop off that organ and lop off this organ. I, so it's not true, it's just there's something about, like, <laughs> you know. Damn. It's like, uh, the, it reminds me of that Monty Python thing where the, so the guy had his arms cut off and his legs cut off, wound. he's like, come at me, come at me, you know, like. <laughs> it's just a flesh wound. It's just a flesh wound, right, it's like that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and Grace, could you, on the Mattermost check, would you mind putting some links to it for us, to your work? Because I think we'd love to get more acquainted sure. and, yeah. and connect you sure. into to what we're doing, et cetera. Um, awesome. Gil, please. 
Yeah, um, I, I love where this conversation is going and I think it deserves a lot more time at another time. Um, so that's one vote for that. Uh, Grace, I think, you know, I, 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 I think Sherry is right that the, the coupling in physical organisms makes all the difference in the world because in social organisms, it's abstractions, it's interpretations of physicality, it's interpretations of value. And we differ very much there in, bi in biomimicry and biological systems, it's concrete. Molecules fit into each other or they do not, period. It doesn't matter what your opinion is about that. So that's part of the challenge we have here. Um, you know, the, the kind of decentralized voluntary association that you're talking about makes a whole lot of sense at a lot of levels. Arguably, an enormous amount of sustainability progress in the world has been developed through voluntary associations, the ISO standards, uh, NGOs pressuring corporates, corporates adopting protocols and agreements and interoperability and supply chain management and so forth that then so sometimes is driven by government but is often picked up later by governments. Um, so that's a very interesting dynamic. I think it's, it's an example of a lot of things in this conversation that are dichotomous, that are you know, opposites in tension with each other. It's not clear to go one way or the other. Um, um, you know, that, that system in, in the, you know, the, the, the economic corporate sustainability system works because the world is globalized. It's harder to imagine it working in a decentralized world with decentralized economies without universal standards across the planet. So there's another dichotomy. Um, you know, to the communities with reputations, uh, I, could, yeah, I could boycott the neighboring communities that supports the slave trade, uh, or I could engage with them and try to talk them out of it, or I could invade them and conquer them and force them to the goodness of my ways, right? Very tricky stuff. And with regard to reputation, uh, Hong Kong had a reputation a lot of people grew, were you know, born there, grew up there, even moved there because of its reputation. And all of a sudden, um, you know, G's reputation is taken over theirs. Boom, done. And it's not like you know, people decide to move to Hong Kong to live in G's system, but people who grew up there had a very different idea of who they were. All of a sudden can't have that idea anymore. Mm -hmm. And some of them are in prison for the rest of their lives already. And some of them will have to build their own prisons around their own selves to be able to survive there. So it's a very tricky mess, um, you know, tangled and multifaceted. And, you know, Ken, Ken commented that, uh, that Schmuckler in, in Parable of the Tribes does a great job of diagnosing the problem, which is that uh, in any kind of collection of societies, the one that is most uh, uh, the one that is most powerful and aggressive will tend to dominate from the ones who are more passive and collaborative. And Ken points out that he doesn't have ideas about how to address the problem uh, because it's a very gnarly. It, it's what Chauncey would call a mess, not a problem. Problem suggests solution. Mess suggests a tangle of trouble that's really hard to untangle, and it requires something else of us that we're not familiar with. I don't even know what that is. Thanks, Gil. And then uh, I haven't read Parable of the Tribes, which I now probably ought to, because the thing I was about to put in the conversation was an eternal puzzle for me, a sad puzzle, which is communities that figure out how to live in community on the commons around the world and are relatively pacifist are consistently, constantly, and eternally run over by uh, more violent tribes nearby that have better weapons. Uh, that's, and, exactly, that's exactly what that book is, is exploring. Yeah, and, and, and that just happens all the time consistently. The colonial era is the perfect example of it and destroyed worldwide wisdom. It was, there was ethnocide at the global scale um, and everybody's like, yay, and, you know, industrialism won, capitalism won, now we have consumerism, all of which are sort of eating our brains. Uh, so, so I think partly what we're describing is what does a distributed insurgency look like against the world systems, against the dominant systems? And I, I would love, as a small side note, but important side note, I would love sort of an honest uh, perspective on Holochain, the project where it stands, what it's doing, because I'm a, I think Arthur Brock is a certifiable genius and, and I've been following Metacurrency for probably two decades. Um, so I, I care a lot about what, what they're building and where they're going. And I just haven't followed closely enough to understand uh, are they re sort of reaching either viability or critical mass or, or any of those kinds of things? And it doesn't look like it. Like I'm not, it feels like a really dicey proposition at this point. Um, and I'd love to have a diagnostic about like what went wrong, what could have been done better, different, it, who else is picking up some of these pieces because they're working pretty openly and a lot of the piece parts are available. Uh, and and uh, in the spirit of MATLAB, 
which is a you know, young people's math competition where the, the algorithmic results for each of the, there's like a challenge posed with a, with a timer. And then everybody poses solutions to the problem and the, the performance of the solution is charted and, and all of the solutions are open sourced. So you can take the solution and tweak it and improve it. And if your results are better on the quiz, then you, you are the present winner and they run it until the timer runs out and whoever has had the best solution sort of won that round. Uh, I, I, that's not a terrible model for solving larger scale social problems uh, in a creative way to say, hey, he, here's an open source solution for how to do this kind of thing, uh, who can make it better? And uh, not that everybody needs to use the same uh, exact model. I think I believe in local adaptation of everything. Um, uh, yeah, Steve Jobs always always wanted everybody. Yeah, Steve Jobs didn't trust anybody who hadn't taken LSD as well. Um, so, so how do we how do we map this out? Uh, so, uh, Pete. Uh, thanks. Um, I wanted to make an observation. I said it in in chat, but um, it seems to me that the problem is that we've got these super scale so social structures that concentrate power and things like that. The the reason so they've they've. I mean, they, they compete outside of human influence, kind of the social structures compete to, to evolve better social structures. Um, uh, we have co-evolved, uh, you know, over the past couple thousand years, we have co-evolved with those social structures, getting bigger and uh, more complicated and taking more power and also being super productive, right? Um, almost all of the you know, innovation that we have over the past couple thousand years and all of the quality of life improvements um, along with the quality of life deficits. But um, uh, we get a ton of benefit from watching these, watching this scale happen, this, this, these super scale social structures doing really incredible advancement, what we think of as advancement, at least uh, maybe in the Western world. Um, uh, and so one of the, one of the problems I see, even in this conversation, kind of in the background, it's like, how can we kind of gradually move to a better thing? Right. And I don't, I don't think we get, I don't think we get to do it gradually. So, um, either maybe a bunch of decentralized humans decide to take over the planet from the super scale social structures, or, um, the planet does it for us, um, and that's kind of looks looks like we're we're kind of headed. Um, uh, we're going to get enough climate cha challenges uh, and you know pandemics or whatever happening that the the whole ship kind of just starts shaking apart, and we get decentralized humans thrust upon us. Um, I don't know, you know, I don't know how that plays out, uh, but I, I can kind of like start to think into the future. And um, uh, I think both of those things might happen kind of at the same time. And I can also imagine one of the futures is we decentralize enough um, and get authoritarian enough that uh, we have big cabals of ugly sets of you know smaller social structures but still big enough to be not human scale in the right way and, and just be nasty for humans and for the planet for another you know centuries or, or thousands of years so um a a way to thread that needle maybe is to make sure that if the wheels are coming off or the the vehicle is shaking apart to make it shake apart in a way that um that is better instead of worse. So maybe that's a target. I don't know. Um, before passing the, the floor to Grace and Doug, uh, I want to note that we're past the 45 minute mark. We've had one human check in so far, um, which I think means that we've turned this call into a salon around the topic. Uh, and that's OK, because I love this conversation. Uh, I just, you know, our, our normal check in rhythm of going around the room and seeing what's up. Uh, has turned into like this this frothy energetic conversation around uh, around this topic uh, we could set up uh, i could easily uh, set up breakout rooms for anybody who wants to uh, go into a different discussion uh, we could also decide to break this conversation up into several we've got like 16 people on the call uh actually make that 15. um see you ken 
Uh, and I'm happy to proceed as we are exactly right now. Any, any feelings one way or the other? Stay the way we are. Stay on train. Stay on the train. Sounds reasonable. Cool. Um, then Doug, then Grace. Uh, actually, Grace, did you drop out because you changed your mind and then came back into the queue? I just thought you wanted to do a check-in. Oh, cool. Um, and you're on the list for check-ins on the spreadsheet too, so I, I saw that. So let's go, Doug, then back to Grace for a second. Okay, I've been thinking about method, uh, how, especially around climate change. And what I've come to is the following method. Try to work out in some detail the scenario of not making it. That is, we live with constant temperature change, rise, and we don't have the leverage to do it. Make that case as strong as possible and then poke holes in it. Look for, are there any holes? Because if there are some holes in that scenario, we should be following up on those. Otherwise, we have such a plenitude of possibilities, we never find a focus of what to do. Thank you. Um, Grace? So this question of like, you know, we don't have time and et cetera, like I, I absolutely agree with what Pete says, like we're not gonna get the chance and it's gonna be the way it is, but it's, and, and we don't know what it's how bad it's gonna be and where it's gonna be and it's gonna be different by region. But, you know, I think of it as like the mathematicians, right? Like from the, from, from the foundation series. Like we're, we're, we're just going through hell, right? It's not like we're about to go hell through hell or we're about to go through the apocalypse. That's what we're doing right now. It's, it's just how it is. And there's a few people in little pockets and it's not about getting the masses to agree. And it's not, it's just, there's people in pockets trying to do these decentralized things. And none of us can scale it because we haven't even gotten it to work at a regional level yet. We just don't have anything to scale. And it's the same thing with Holochain. Like you said, it's open source. It, it, you know, they keep, everything you said is accurate. You know, there's some things I can't say about that having worked there for a few months and there's some things I can say, but most of it's public. It's just, it's just obvious. And they're trying to solve something really, really, really hard. So it's, it's like, oh, it's not going. It's like, okay, you know, next try, next person. And I think that's where we all are. And I think that what, one of the things that I don't spend a lot of time doing is trying to get people to go to my project and so their project or, you know, go in one way and so the other way. I have this trust that we are part of an organism, whether, we're, however aware we are and, you know, however much acid we may or may not have dropped, it doesn't really matter. We're part of a something and that expresses itself in what we see the part of the problem that we want to solve to be. And that's fine. You know, I'm interested in a particular way of implementing a particular thing. And, you know, Doug is interested in doing it a different way. And, and I think we just trust in that. that. That's all we've got. And no, we're not going to make it. It's going to be really disastrous. But enough of us hopefully will make it fast enough that it'll be 30,000 years instead of 30,000, you know, 300,000 years. That, that's all we've got, really. That's kind of my how to do it. So one of my hopes, even in the small group that is OGM at this point, <clears throat> um, one of my hopes is that some of the people with big visions might somehow sit with one another. And maybe this is pairwise. I don't know and figure out where the overlaps and parallels are. And if there's a, if there's a way to create sort of um, uh, slime mold style merger events of some, of some sort, so that, so that you know, we don't have 50 different initiatives, but we have 20 different initiatives, and then we can figure out how to align and how to connect. And if the initiatives run counter to each other directly, like they have completely different conceptions of where the levers are, what to push, what to pull, that's really important to note. In particular, if, they're, if they neutralize each other in some way, you know, hey, we need to build the Dyson sphere in outer space. Uh, hey, we need to grow a lot of forests. Uh, those might coexist, they might not. Um, and so I, one of the things in the back of my head is how can we take our visions uh, a, manifest them so that they're more usable, available, uh, applicable, testable in the world. B, move them toward one another to figure out, uh, uh, 
is this batch of stuff and this batch of stuff really the same thing just said in two elegant different ways? And if so, how do they work together to make that work? And then in, in the areas where they're really different, what does that mean? What else do they connect to? And how do we form a distributed um, uh, kind of kind of like a Red Rover, Red Rover or whatever, except everybody's pulling in a slightly different direction, but, but, but kind of linked, you know, linked arms. Uh, in these movements, and and I don't know exactly what that is. I'm trying to figure out um, how to how to get there. So let's go, Doug, then Bentley. Oh, I forgot to take my hand off. I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. Thank you, Bentley. The floor is yours. Cool. So just wanted to. Um, Jerry was asking about systems that help this, and Grace talked about not having people draw people, you know, pull people from their projects to your own. But I'm gonna. Well, I'm not going to do that, but I'll just throw it out there because it, it's very similar and tangential to um, to what uh, Grace was talking about. Uh, so I've got a Gullybot project that, although not on distributed technology, it is distributed social societal problem solving where everyone gets a voice. And just like I think John was saying before that kind of the equal time metaphor, but instead of having that, it's a place where everyone can go and if they find their thoughts, their evidence or reasons for doing something there and they feel fully heard and expressed in that, then they don't need to repeat. So it's not a war of who can talk the most or game the systems. It's more of making sure all the, all the sides are represented in a, in a single kind of structured document. That's the kind of things I and several other people working on in the canonical debate lab. Um, which we hope to eventually put on a distributed file system. Um, so just to give you a, an idea of some of the projects are out there. Uh, so if any of this sounds interesting, be sure and look around the OGM channels. Um, Bentley, uh, love that. How, and, and haven't attended anything from Canonical Debate Lab and several of you are kind of, we're, we're kind of intermingled, but we're not yeah. you know, having idea sex at this point. Um, and I'm wondering- Idea flirting. Yeah, exactly. There's like the, the odd glance across the room is happening, but, but right. we're not really we're not really going at it in terms of how to how to blend, improve and create a community that makes each of these ideas better uh, and connecting them in some way. What might we do to do that? Uh, I, I think uh, I think the canonical De debate lab considers ourselves a subgroup of OGM. We're just not in the matter most. Um, uh, so maybe we should kind of move there from Slack. And You're then the other totally thing totally welcome to be there yeah. entirely. That would be great. And then the other option may be if we had a centralized place like this, like the check-in calls, but maybe a project check-in where the projects come and say what they're doing, invite participants. Um, might be an interesting idea. Because I, I don't want to, you know, take up this kind of check-in with with those type of things. But maybe cool. it, it, it probably would have been appropriate, but. If a piece of if, if a piece of check in was you and Jamie reporting in some like crazy progress on some piece of this puzzle, I'd be like over the moon. I'd be yeah. over the moon. And I think that those kinds of technical solutions, social solutions, things we've found are part of what what I'm I'm hoping check in sort of creates and delivers is that mechanism where we're like, hey, look what we did. And part of what we need more of is us understanding what the puzzle looks like, and then people who care about different pieces of the puzzle running off and, and solving them or taking a, a swing at them with our with the rest of our help as much as we can and then bringing them back to the middle, which is kind of the check-in and the channels we have on Mattermost and saying, hey, here, look, uh, here's what we're up to. Yeah, um, maybe we could even make just a general centralized project check-in and Mattermost a channel to where it's okay for us to just like spam with what's going on and people can jump into that stream when they have time. <laughs> a piece of what I'm hoping we do is, and maybe this is a piece of what Vincent is doing with Trove that we can use, is that uh -huh. there's kind of a dashboard of what projects think of themselves as being affiliated with OGM in any way. And then you could go to each of them and not just see name of project, where's your website and what's up and, and sort of who's there, but actually sort of a current state of the, uh, of, of the project. Uh, so that it would be pretty simple to go do your own check-in just by browsing through Trove, for example, or Trove plus Massive, or we need to sort of figure out where that information lives uh, so that then our check-in calls aren't just coming up to date. It's a little bit like one of the reasons I like Facebook and there's plenty of reasons to not like Facebook is that my conversations with people in my broad social circles are no longer, hey, what's up with you? Oh, we had a kid, I got sick, I traveled to, to whatever. The conversations are not like, 
damn, that trip to Belgium looked awesome. And I'm so sorry that your daughter had like tonsillitis. Like it, it, like our, the peripheral vision we have now is so good into all of these different, different kinds of communities that the nature of our conversations gets to change. So how do we do that with tools here so that we're not bringing everybody up to speed each call on what our project is, but rather here's, here's what, what cracked last week Go look at this page to figure out exactly where we are and let them, like, this is the progress we're making. I'd love to see that. Yeah, I think um, putting that in Trove is a brilliant idea. And of course, or Matt and or Matt, uh, or yeah. um, Meta Wiki. Uh, massive, uh, massive. Yeah. Dang it, I almost had it. Massive Matter <laughs> Wiki most. I don't know. <laughs> right, right. They're all blending in my mind. Uh, Klaus. Yeah, I think. What, what fits into this conversation we had uh, in this in this course for evolutionary leadership, a conversation with Noah Bateson, which I which which really to me was uh, an eye opener because um, I, I specifically asked uh, a question about how do you how do you move millions of people uh, into a different direction. Um, and 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 what and why is a Donald Trump succeeding you know, to inspire millions of people? But then, on the other hand, we we get wrapped up in in uh, uh, knots, you know, trying to figure out how how to do that. So she was. So I I, I, when I was laying out to her. Here is Yuval Harari. There's Otto Sharma. I mean, there, there, there is Donella Meadows and. How, here's how this all sort of fits together in how these uh, leading thinkers uh, uh, have come to, to a theory of, of social systems uh, uh, intervention. Yeah? Um, and she was very passionately in saying uh, that um, Cambridge Analytica you know, is one example how uh, a Trump can happen uh, in, in this uh, modern contextualized um, um, communication structure, but um, under, but the, the, the opposite of doing good is not Cambridge Analytica good, right? I mean, and then I'm going, well, why not, right? I mean, the, the whole point is you need to have a unifying theory. You need to have and this is Donald, the Donald Meadows model. You, 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 you have to have a narrative that guides you, you know, that guides uh, the, the organization, that guides uh, um, the, 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 the overall direction. And then that needs to be contextualized into different parts of the economy because it means different things uh, uh, to, to people who are working in various roles within the economy. So why not take the Cambridge Analytica method that takes pieces of information that all lead back to the same root, but, but contextualize the information differently. And, and I, I think um, we need to, and this is what, what Pete was saying in the, in the just as I, as I joined here, decentralization works for QAnon and Al-Qaeda, of course it works. That's exactly what they're doing. They have a unifying idea which they then uh, distribute and, and enable, empower individual actors you know, to function, of course, to, for you know, all the wrong reasons. But why not apply that you know, and use it for good, use it to support uh, 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 people to go into a community and assess you know, what needs to be done here, what can be done here, and then engage and be supported by a structure you know, that, that, uh, that, brings, that brings together the, the, uh, the tools and the, the processes that, that are needed to develop within a community and, and secure a community uh, from an ecosystem perspective, food system, biodiversity perspective. So that was a little long, but, but uh, um, you know, I, I think we just need to grab on to Here's the right thing to do. You know, here's what the community really should should look like to secure itself, and then let's see what we can build around this to develop that. Mm -hmm. 
And alas, we have really divergent views about what the best thing to do might be. Apparently, many countries are split 50-50, like almost down the middle in, in, in different ways. So that, that's hard for everybody inside of one of these artificial things we call countries. It's not hard <clears throat> for communities that are linking up across the world in virtual spaces. It's like, you know, they're gathering up in Game B or Theory U or uh, what have you in lots of different communities that are trying to sort this out. Uh, and then two things I just wanted to add, add to what you said. One is that um, I think one of the reasons a whole lot of people support Trump and people like Trump is the rest of the conversation we've had here. Uh, the world is broken and the systems of the world are all corrupt and broken. And I'm, oh, I'm exaggerating. There's some systems that actually work that are functional, but in general, people don't see a better future than, for themselves. And I think a lot of in the in the jobs to be done framework of you you buy a copy to serve to, to you hire a copy to serve a particular job in your day. Uh, people hired Trump to break the system, and they didn't mind if he was corrupt and if he got wealthy and his buddies got his cronies got wealthy doing it because there was a chance that this clown was going to actually destroy the system enough that something else could climb in its place. And people like Steve Bannon are busy planning for that apocalypse so that they can be the ones who install the new OS of authoritarian populism uh, that runs the next couple centuries. That's like, I think Steve Bannon's big hope. Um, and instead we have a whole bunch of really interesting, interesting, genuinely caring people who are busy trying to figure out how does the distributed thing work? And how do we make decisions together? How do we, how do we aim toward like human thriving, et cetera? Uh, and, and who knows how that works. And then another part of what you said about Donella Meadows and her points of intervention, you know, leverage points in a system, how do we instrument knowledge like that so that it's easily available and more usable to people who are trying to tip systems? Like I, I see Donella quoted all the time. I don't, and maybe that just means everybody should read the, read the paper and just go act on it. But I think there's more interesting ways to figure out how to apply Meadows thinking and Lynn Ostrom's thinking and uh, indigenous thinking and like, like the Maori ways of looking at stewardship and, and, and so forth. Like how do we instrument them so that they're more usable and useful so that instead of being trapped in Gmail jail, we're actually in an environment where these ideas are usable. So that's what I mean by contextualizing the information. So what does, what does a farmer have to know about climate change, about soil, about water, uh, in order to act outright? What does a restaurant owner need to know? You know what does a, an office where, or what does a housewife with children need to know? And, and I think it's, it's this kind of contextualization that doesn't necessarily go into the very big picture, but it goes into what do I need to secure myself within this community? Klaus, it's another place where the dichotomies are just inescapable. I need to know my place. I need to know the dynamics and the relationships and trajectories of the place that I live so I can adapt to here. But finding the context for that requires global information and global information systems and international coordination. So the, the, the dynamic between the global and the local is, is a really rich and interesting and very tricky one. Is it, and, and different kinds of layers of coordination and governance that weave through all that. I mean, it's hard to draw a systems diagram of the world so it looks like spaghetti, not like an organization of chart. Um, and to complicate matters for what you're aiming for, Gil, we're entering the, this kind of weird sort of Stalinist era of, around data and statistics. It's Lysenkoism kind of worldwide where the, so when, the, when the statistics started not serving the Soviet leaders, they basically got rid of the statisticians and started ignoring statistics. And they were like, nope, not a good discipline. And, and they, they sort of deprecated a lot of really smart people who were trying to help build the great Soviet state and really screwed things up. And so globally, the deprecation or our intentional undermining of science, facts, journalism, electoral systems, and, and you know, trust in each other is, is doing that to us. We're sort of in this global mud pile that resembles uh, uh, Vladimir Surkin's fog on the battlefield, uh, which has us in you know, like the nonlinear war that we're in or something like that. Like, like we're just kind of in that mire so that Clarity, I think, will be valued and appreciated. It's just really hard to get to. And when you have systems of systems of systems that are all interacting and re, you know, reinforcing each other, 
uh, I, the systems diagrammer who can, who can illustrate that, I, I have not met. People feel disempowered at the community level, but they clearly understand that we have a problem with our water. We have a, a, we have a problem with, uh, our, with air quality, with our local food supply, but they feel helpless you know, in, in uh, doing much about it. So that is where, I mean, Stuart, uh, 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 one of our fellows here, uh, has the idea of impact specialists, right? He puts an impact specialist into the community who then talks with interested parties or with sympathetic parties, what can we do about this? How can we tackle this problem? And I think that's, that's what uh, the, the idea of a, in, of a uh, innovation spoker has, you know, the impact specialist, go into a community, know what to look for, you know, uh, gather the, the, the things that need to be fixed where people have already an opinion about wanting to fix it, but not knowing how to go about it. Mm -hmm. um, Pete, it, it feels like what Klaus was just saying about the innovation brokers and our conversations about human routers next to good data and all that kind of thing. Uh, it, this feels like a description of a service core that would be really useful to have. And, and there are some sort of, there's like a gap year and a bunch of other entities that, that do interesting things. Uh, maybe we could approach one of these groups and try to describe what this thing looks like so that uh, young people trying to figure out what to do between college or whether or not to go to college, for example, um, could actually spend a year or two uh, becoming these kinds of people who understand where resources are, trying to be of help locally uh, in, a, in a completely local, appropriate way, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, John. Yeah, a possible, Pete, this isn't a solution, <laughs> but it's, a, it's, a, it's an element. It's something to include. Uh, is a kind of um, modular scalable dashboarding. And uh, a name on this is Katie Patrick, uh, probably already in the brain. Uh, the idea is, you know, you just, you put this thing out and you don't, you don't try to hit people on the head with the context, but you do try to, you know, you publish this number, which is the, the uh, solidity, you know, the number of this different kinds of things in your water and then this kind of thing going on in the air and this kind of thing going on in the electricity consumption. And, you keep it very simple so that it's defendable in terms of its accuracy. The implications, that's a different conversation. That's a conversation that is multi-level and it goes on in the sub-communities where you know, that is the, the context for that community and the, and, the, and the way for it to occur. But the main thing is you get the dashboard up, you, you make sure it's pretty accurate and you don't try to make it say more, you know, you don't go out to three decimal places. You say, look, you know, the, we've, we figured out the error on this and this is the, you know, we're, we're definitely within the error range of what we're claiming. And what does it mean? Uh, you know, there's several interpretations. Here's one of them. Sorry, I had to change seats. Um... Well, that's good. We've had one person check in and it took us a really long wait. Thanks, John. Uh, and Ken, who is next in the spreadsheet dropped off. Grace, you've, you've uh, mentioned a few things. Did you want to check in in a different way? No, that really, you know, those check-ins were really <laughs> up my alley. I have nothing else to say that turned out to be really perfect. Awesome. Uh, Bentley, you were also on the spreadsheet for checking in. Uh, is there anything yeah. else you'd like to put on the table? <laughs> Selfishly, um, uh, and I posted it in the town hall um, as uh, uh, I, would, I did an experimental podcast with a group of people, including a rhetoric professor, where we do a, um, and so we're just trying to get feedback to see whether this is something people want to exist, uh, where we kind of do a sports center play-by-play -play on public arguments between famous people and talk about how they could approve that process. And since we're a group that has a lot of deliberators and, and um, I thought y'all might find it interesting and could tell me whether we're should pursue this idea or not so thank you I'll go look I mean I'm reminded of mystery science theater 2000 uh it's kind of because, that on twitter yeah yeah because because having a sense of humor about these things really helps it diffuses a lot of tension it kind of helps and so kind of serious humor is is a useful uh, container or, or tone 
to hit in some of these things. I, I, yeah, I probably should actually look for an actual comedian. There's several podcasts where it's like a lawyer and a comedian and a politician and a comedian. So if, if anyone knows anybody who um, enjoys that, um, that would, you know, that'd be a good idea. Too. So um, what's his name? Darn it. Uh, there's a comedian who has Patriot Act, which was a really interesting, Hassan Minaj. Yeah, I don't um, think I could actually get anyone on the show. But <laughs> yeah, well, uh, well, I mean, uh, if anyone he, knows him, an introduction would be appreciated. Yeah, one of the interesting things about Patriot Act was that uh, Hassan, it's basically like John Oliver, but John Oliver sits at a desk and has a little rectangle next to him with a couple of illustrations. Hassan is standing on a live stage and they have some really sophisticated graphics people who are busy using the, the background. It's a complete surround set. It's not AR or XR or anything like that, but it's an immersive set and they're data people. Like if, if we knew anybody who knew anybody who knew, who's, who's like on his data crew and, and visualization crew, that might be a really, really interesting avenue. And I don't think they're doing Patriot Act anymore, but what does the, what does the next step of that look like? Um, yeah, that's a very OGME um, idea to do compelling visualizations and kind of a talk, not a talk show format, but a presentation format. I like that. Um, that's a different idea than we're pursuing here. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's a good Sorry. idea. Sorry. And, and also like, what would it be like to have people with different political persuasions using the same set of tools to present their commentary on it? So, yeah. you know, Lindsey Graham could be up on stage next to Hassan or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Um, we're near the end of our, of our 90 minutes. Uh, why don't I just go back to normal check-in mode and just ask for whoever else would like to step in and check in. And, and Lauren, we, we, we went to the spreadsheet to try to do a different kind of check-in where people sign themselves up. And then uh, John was the first on the spreadsheet. So we went there and we have spent most of the call talking about the questions that John laid on the table early on. Uh, Doug, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I wanna come back to John's view about the dashboard. I think the dashboard is actually a doable project with this group. Uh, and it could be, it, it could uh, spread rapidly because it's a, a, a picture, a believable picture of what's going on, I think would be helpful. Uh, dashboards at which level? At the individual venture level? At the social uh, dilemma at, level? At the... at, I think it should have different levels. There should, there should be a global, uh, there should be a regional, and there should be local. I think the global one looks like the guy holding up the, bull, the, the sign that says shit is bullshit and fucked up, but. No, the, the, the global one has things like parts per million of CO2, uh, what's happening with temperatures, uh, what's happening with fisheries. It could have maybe 20 issues that stay up to date with the data uh, that would be informing to anybody who was interested in particular to reporters, I think would be helpful. Yeah. Um, so one of my one of my wishes is that individuals with strong points of view and some narrative, some storytelling skill, pick up data like that and each have a point of view expressed online somewhere in a usable way, like a dashboard, but more like a story frame uh, that is connected then to the underlying data of their argument. And so. Uh, yeah, and, and, and Gil is pointing out that there's a bunch of statistically oriented sites. There's also a Gapminder uh, from you know Rosling and Company, uh, and and there and around COVID there were there was Johns Hopkins and a bunch of other sites just tracking COVID health and vaccination rates and mortality and, and all of that kind of thing. So so sort of place by place there are a bunch of different sites that are available, um, but 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 I think that just Ross like. Azim Azar has a newsletter and every every uh, week he puts in there like what the parts per million uh, are this week and you get numb to the number. You, you're like, oh, that looks really bad, but it was really bad last week. I don't know how to be angrier about it or more upset about it. But if somebody could set a, a, a narrative around it and then be connections to what to do to like go, uh, go, go connect, I think it gets really powerful really fast. And, and people are already doing different pieces of what I'm describing. There's great storytellers out there. There's data collections. Uh, there's a little bit of dashboards going on. How do we, how do we connect them into a, a functional whole? I think overlaying the data 
dashboard with narratives was weigh it down too much. There are too many narratives. Uh, I keep them separate. Doesn't mean to not develop the narratives, which I really believe in. Uh, but it's as a method, I think just doing the dashboard by itself in an attractive way across the dashboards that people are doing now that you mentioned. In the little scenario I just mentioned, I wouldn't obliterate the data on the dashboards. I'd leave the dashboards entirely, but I would then bring up a, a, a level, a layer, a generation of people with strong opinions and storytelling skills to use that data well. Stacy. Yeah, I was just going to say to what you were talking about and John and uh, Bentley, I would suggest going to groups like Brave Angels, where there are already participants that come from different opinions, but also have that ability to talk together and to have constructive arguments and to use that as a population to try out some of your different projects rather than just looking for extremes, which is just going to cause more division. A great idea to go to groups like River Angels who care about this and have you know interested in interesting people, et cetera. Um, who knows somebody in Braver Angels? I think we all probably do. It would be great to just like have the capacity to to glance at well, any one of us could do a LinkedIn search for ourselves and Braver Angels and figure out what our links are, but it'd be great to be able to do like for everybody on this call, here's that search. And here, here are the here are the proximities. Here are the here are the overlaps and hits. Go ahead, Gil. Um, when when we were building the first corporate sustainability dashboards back in the late '90s, um, uh, a lot of people saw them as analytical tools to see data and slice and dice data, which of course they were. But the story we told was that this is like this is like the council fire. That for thousands of years, at the end of every day, we would sit in a circle around a fire all focused on the fire and each other and telling the story of what happened that day and what we think might happen the next day. And so we saw the dashboard as a, as a, as a, as a, as a, as a venue for a different kind of conversation. So people could look at the vital signs, look at the trends, uh, say, hey, well, that's, that, asked, you know, that provokes for me, what about this other trend? And then talk. And in that talk, you know, values and concerns surface and the possibility of finding a path together surfaces. So it was the, it was the you know, highly technical tool as an enabler for something very soft and rich, which I think is what we're talking about here. Agreed. Um, and how do we provoke more of those conversations and make them more fruitful? Any other thoughts? Anyone else want to check in? Uh, Klaus. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, um, we need to have millions of people change uh, their behavior and adapt to a different world. And there is, that's no way, nowhere more profound than in the way we call our food and consume food. Uh, because it is it's just one simple statistics, we need to use cover crops in order to restore soil back to health. In the US, only 12% of farmers are using cover crops and those 12%, the vast majority of them are being terminated with glyphosate before they mature to then make room for what they call the cash crop, which is typically a GMO crop that's being raised with more chemicals. To change that, the farmer needs a market to sell into. In order for that to happen, we need to change our menus because cover crops are more like legumes, pulses, yeah? And, and, and they, are, they are integrated into every other ancient cuisine around the world, not in the US where we completely mucked up uh, our diet. So, so that needs to be understood you know, by so many people who, who, then, uh, who, then, who then are prepared and have reasons to change uh, their diet, but for, for a number of, for, 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 for different perspectives, maybe for health reasons. You know, not for environmental reasons and so on. So that message needs to be modulated and and contextualized to different to to, to mean something to different groups of people. So it's very technical uh, in 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 some ways. You know, to to, to induce this kind of of change. Mm -hmm. Um, you just remind. <laughs> I love that kill. Uh, you, you just reminded me of, of uh, there's a hobby out there, believe it or not, called rolling coal, uh, which is basically changing how your engine works on a big truck so that it will emit a lot more smoke. And it is absolutely 
a pushback, a backlash against conservation and all those kinds of things. And people get together and, and have like rolling coal parties and, and contests. And, and I guess, I don't know, they, they must have like seasickness pills along, along the way. There's also another hobby that was popular maybe a decade ago called Harry, Just, on, just yeah? on the rolling coal, it's, it's fascinating because it damages their vehicles, it costs them more money, but it pisses off us. Exactly. It, and this, part, of the, part of the Bannon strategy, I'm convinced, has been to do stuff that is so ballsly stupid to drive us into sputtering apoplectic immobility. I believe that. You, you look at the conversations on Facebook over the past five years and you see an enormous drift to just, you know, just complaining. Isn't that terrible? Look, do you believe how stupid the other side is rather than generative conversations? Yes. And I believe the bumper sticker on this is making liberals cry. Um, and, and, but I want to, I want to hold up rolling coal opposite hypermiling, which was a hobby, I don't know, in the nineties or I don't know, some, some couple decades ago. And hypermiling was, Hey, look how far I can make my car go on a mile of gas. And all kinds of strategies from the simple ones like coasting when you're downhill, you know, disengaging the engine to like pretty exotic things and, and hypermiling got big. And it's like, how do we create a bunch of social, contagious social things that are in fact good for the earth? Um, and how do we lance the anger boil that creates things like rolling coal, right? And, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. But, but if we could, if if we could generate, uh, if we could invent a generative hobby like free hugs that was <clears throat> easy to easy to implement, absolutely socially contagious, um, and good for the earth, that's a big win. If a lot of people pick it up and start doing it, like if the number of people who played Pokemon Go got up and went and did something fruitful, uh, that's a big dent. Uh, I like that, Dre. Um, thanks for those. Um, I wanted to ask Klaus. Um, Klaus, is there uh, a place where where do you talk about maybe the top three things um, about improving food systems, um, like uh, cr cover crops that we eat rather than cover crops that we throw away? Well, there are there are uh, a lot of platforms, um, and there's a lot of discussions. What is missing? Uh, is the socioeconomic perspective of what this all means, you know, because the, the, uh, there, there, is, there is a lot of clarity in uh, USDA, you know, the Vilsack talks about it, uh, the farm associations are talking about it, but at the end of the day, um, it won't, nothing will happen until a few million people decide that uh, they want to participate in this. So it's the socioeconomic component that, that, that hasn't been addressed. And that needs to happen at community level because here you need to engage, for example, the school catering uh, company. That, needs, that means a lot of mothers need to engage and, uh, and demand that their children get healthy food in the schools. It's the hospitals that are now starting uh, to focus on nutrition to, to round off their treatments. So it, it, it is happening in this hyper-local context. Um, but again, there are, there are macro uh, level um, uh, understandings of, of, of what needs to be done. But to translate that into people accepting and understanding it within you know, their own frame, that is the challenge. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm interested, I'm, I'm thinking about, I guess, uh, just something that, that called to me just now. Um, I'm interested in a website that has maybe like the top three awareness things about changing our food systems. Um, uh, I guess what I want is a link that I can post on Twitter and keep posting on Twitter and post everywhere I can think of. Here's, you know, here's the, not everything and not in lots of complex detail, but, you know, if, if I want the world to be a better place, what are like the three things that I should be thinking of? We're starting to see those, I don't know, the, it, it reminds me a little bit of all the pandemic information. We've got way too much pandemic information and it's really hard to find it, but it's, or it's really hard to sort out the, the wheat from the chaff. But at the same time, people have gotten into a rhythm of finding a, a few resources that they can listen to and they go, okay, 
I, under, I understand vaguely why I would wear a mask and I understand vaguely why I would, you know, social distance or whatever. So just that kind of, um, I, I guess, I'm not interested in making a website that a million people are going to look at, but I am interested in making a website where 10,000 people can go, oh, I kind of get it. I am going to start choosing, you know, I'm going to start asking for diets where I'm eating cover crops rather than I'm going to continue to ask for glyphof glyphosate um, crops, right? Just, just kind of that, not, not, um, not, not all the information and not even in a lot of detail, but you know, what are the, where are we going over the next five years if we want the, the planet to be a healthier place? So influence the influences. You know, I mean, for, for we, we need to have like a cartel of influencers who in turn use, use uh, you know, their, their insights in, at, at a community level. If we know, only knew any influencers. Um, one person who's trying to do this, and I don't know what his website looks like, but I'll go look now, is Saul Griffith. Um, who cares a lot, who did his personal energy audits in considerable detail, whose mantra right now, I think, is electrify everything. And he's like, hey, one of the big solutions here is to just electrify everything. And Doug, I'd be really interested in your take on, on him because you, you're really concerned about re the replacement of appliances, for example. If we replace fossil fuel burning appliances, that's a huge cost, et cetera, et cetera. But I think he's gone way deep into that. And also like Brad Templeton, uh, has a logical answer to just about everything. I, I do believe he's like the reincarnation of Spock uh, in several different ways. But I, I'm also noticing that we're at the end of our, of our call time. Um, this has not been a normal check-in, but it's been a delightful conversation. I think today was like Salonville uh, uh, of thorny world problems. I think that it's possible to get thorny world problem exhaustion. This for me was an uplifting conversation. I hope it was for you. Uh, feel free to feedback on process and all that uh, on the on the Mattermost chat for these calls for the OGM calls. That would be that would be great. Anyone with a final closing word for this call? Well, just Lauren? the problem of electrifying everything. You have to produce the electricity that goes to the electrical appliances, and we don't know how to do that without coal and gas at the moment. Uh, which I think Saul addresses a lot. So I, I think uh, pulling those things apart would be interesting. And also photovoltaic cells may well give us energy too cheap to meter um, uh, with, with like location independence because you just drop PV cells someplace and create a battery. Uh, Lauren, did you want to say something also? I thought I saw you hold up your hand. It's my auctioneer's instinct. Okay. Um, I'll, then I'll, hold, I'll just hold up mine for a second to say that yeah the the the, ener the PV energy too cheap, cheap cheap to meter is the assumption behind Saul's story about electrify everything. Yes, we do know how to do this. We haven't done it yet, uh, but there's another constraint that comes there, which is the rare earth metals minerals that are required to do that. Uh, lithium mining is going to become the next big environmental issue, but there are folks looking at ocean harvest of lithium that may circumvent that. But it's a question of how fast things move if you're going planetary scale. Yep. And there's also tremendous amounts of research on batteries, always has been, but they're starting to try to find how do we make efficient batteries that don't use rare earth metals, that don't use all unobtainium, basically, uh, or, or you know, all the things that are, that are harmful that way. Um, with that, I thank everybody for, for being on this call. Thank you very much. See you on the inner tubes and uh, next week. Same bat channel, same bat time. Thanks all. Good to see you, Laura.